All right, so uh, welcome to another lecture in PNS Genomics course. So it's our pleasure today to have Jeremy Kem, who is a PhD student at Safari Research Group. And uh, today he will present about a very interesting uh, filter for a read mapping called Grim Filter. Uh, and uh, yeah, Jeremy, the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, so I believe you are all required to watch a video of this earlier. Um, so hopefully this session can be more interactive and I can answer any questions that you had. But anyways, I'll go through the slides and you can stop me at any time. Um, yeah, so I'll be presenting Grim Filter, which is a fast seed location filtering um, mechanism in DNA read mapping, uh, which uses processing and memory technologies. Um, and this was um, published at a, or this was presented at ACB, ACPB, APBC, and uh, published in BMC uh, Genomics back in 2018. So I'll begin with an executive summary. Um, genome read mapping is a very important problem and is the first step in genome analysis. Uh, read mapping is an approximate string matching problem. And it's essentially for the problem that we're particularly looking at, we are trying to find um, the best fit of a uh, hundred character strings into a three billion character dictionary. And that three billion character dictionary is the human genome. Um, so alignment is currently the best method for determining the similarity between two strings, but it's very expensive as it relies on a N squared um, dynamic programming algorithm. And so we propose an algorithm called Grim filter, which accelerates the read mapping process by reducing the number of required alignments. And we design Grim filter such that it's able to be easily accelerated using processing and memory, um, which is a technology that is that basically adds simple logic into a 3d stack memory um, and it has high internal memory bandwidth and enables um, performing parallel filtering so with processing in memory grim filter is able to deliver up to a 3.7x speed up i'll first begin with the motivation and goal um, and this is basically the outline of the talk that i'll be giving so uh, sequencing refers to the process of determining the series of nucleotide base pairs in a DNA strand. And DNA is comprised of four different base pairs, which are referred to as A, C, G, and T. Today's machines sequence short strands, which are referred to as reads. And reads are on the order of 100 to 20K base pairs. Um, I guess nowadays they can be longer, but that was what it was back in the day. Um, and um, as a general rule of thumb, uh, sequencers that result in larger reads are more expensive and produce more erroneous reads, um, whereas the ones that produce shorter base pairs are cheaper and are more accurate. And so that's why we're basically focusing on these shorter reads um, in, our, in our paper. And the human genome is approximately 3 billion base pairs. Um, therefore, the genomes must be cut into reads uh, which are sequenced independently and then reconstructed. So read mapping is the first step in analyzing someone's genome to detect predispositions to diseases, personalized medicine, and of course, popularly now is to identify different COVID variants. So the goal here is to accelerate end-to-end um, -end performance of read mapping. I'll go into the background of read mappers um, and in this paper, we focused on hash table based um, read mappers because they were more accurate and more comprehensive um, compared to other methods. So what read mappers do is basically take a number of the sequenced reads, um, which are around 100 base pairs in our in our paper here, and we reconstruct the full genome, which is the green strand on the right. And so Thankfully, we have a known reference genome that exhibits 99.9% .9 similarity across humans. Um, and this is generally true across any organisms of the same species. Um, and this, this reference genome enables us to map our reads to the known reference with some minor differences allowed, which then requires the approximate string matching problem. Um, and, and the differences um, between like, my 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 genome and the reference genome or someone else's genome is what makes each of us unique so because the reference genome exhibits high similarity long sequences in reads match to the reference genome perfectly so here we 
have nine sequential nucleotides in this read, this red strand read here of size 11 that match perfectly to the reference genome. Um, so we can use hash tables to quickly help map the reads. And I'll, I'll talk about how we do that next. So before mapping any reads, we generate a hash table once per reference, which can be used to map any number of reads to the specific reference genome. The keys in the hash tables are k-length sequences, which are referred to as k-mers, and the values are lists of locations in the reference genome that the particular k-mer occurs in. So in this example, we see that the sequences of five A's here on the left occurs in six locations, which is shown on the right. We generate the key value pairs for every permutation of k-mers for the chosen value of k. And so this hash table um, depends on, you know, the, the number of keys depends on the size of the, the k-mers chosen. And so here, just to emphasize, we see that the sequence, the k-mer AAAAT occurs starting at the 36th and at the 434th base pairs of the reference genome. And so if you see that sequence, then you can immediately um, go to that location in the reference and then extract the sequence of relevance. Um, so we can query this hash table to get the substrings from the reference and basically uh, localize our approximate string matching to those regions rather than looking at the entire reference. And so this hash table based method um, makes things very fast. So, so here I'll show you the process of how we can actually use this hash table in read mapping for a single kamer in a single read. Note that for every single read, we must extract x plus one kamers, where x is equal to the maximum number of allowable errors between a string match. And this essentially guarantees that one of the kamers will match perfectly in the reference genome. And this comes from the pigeonhole principle, if you're familiar with that. So from any given read, we select kamers and retrieve their location lists from the hash tables. And then we retrieve the appropriate reference substrings from the reference genome according to the location and the offset of the k-mers within the read. We then compare each of these reference substrings against the read sequence using alignment, an expensive dynamic programming algorithm, algorithm. And we note that cases with clear mismatches should not waste compute resources via string comparison. We also have to mat repeat this entire process for many, many reads whose order can be approximated by dividing the genome length by the read sequence length. In the case that the human genome is length 3 billion and for 100 base pair read length sequences, we will have at least 30 million reads. And this will increase as you, as you want higher coverage of the, of the references, which will give you higher uh, confidence of your alignments. So most of these locations we compare do not match the reads. We find that 99.9% .9 of these actually result in a mismatch. So it's more efficient to build a filter that quickly identifies and discards such locations without doing the comparison to the reference genome. And so we want to filter out these um, locations that will result in mismatches very quickly. So alignment is the algorithm for determining a match between a read and a reference substring. And this is very expensive and requires the use of the dynamic programming algorithm. To give a scale of required computation, a single human can generate millions to billions of reads, and each read, result, uh, each read results in multiple locations. So you'll have to check many of these locations. Modern read mappers reduce the time spent on alignment for increased performance, and this can be done in two ways. By further optimizing the alignment algorithm, which many prior works have tried, or by reducing the number of alignments necessary by filtering out mismatches quickly. Both of these methods are used by mappers today, but now filtering has replaced alignment as the bottleneck. So our goal is to improve the filtering step in read mappers. So now let's take a look at how the hash table based read mapper would work with a filter. So taking the same read um, split into k-mers of length five, um, and we query the hash table for the location lists, we then pass the locations through the filter and attempt to efficiently discard as many locations as possible before having to run alignment. Here we see that the locations that are obviously mismatched um, get discarded before needing alignment. And then all the, all the sequences that pass the filter must be aligned against the string, um, against the original read. So any location that passes through the filter but then fails the alignment is called a false negative. And false negative rates and the filtering speed are important metrics for analyzing the filter. So note that when the filter was added, we were able to forego three instances of alignment here. 
um, thus saving us execution time. So now let's get into our proposal, which is Grim Filter. Um, I'll talk about Grim Filter in three steps. First, we'll discuss the data structures required for Grim Filter. Then we'll talk about how we query the data structures. And then, um, then we'll talk about how we integrate Grim Filter into a mapper. So the data structure necessary, um, we define as bins. And we basically take the full genome and partition it into these large sequences called bins. So we have um, a bin here that represents the sequence. And then we, we create a bit vector that represents a bin. Uh, and the bit and the bit vector um, essentially is a <coughs> is a array that holds the occurrence of a, all permutations of a small string or a token in the bin. So here, um, in this particular bin, um, this bit vector indicates that there is a small token of five a's here, but then there is no occurrence of four a's and then a c here, based on the one and zero values of this particular bin. Um, yeah, and then to account for, and because we want like a whole read to occur within a single bin, we have to uh, chunk, the, chunk the reference into multiple bins that overlap. And so basically um, any read will, is guaranteed to fall within, uh, fully fall within a given bin. So this overlap basically has to be at least um, as long as the size of the read. Jeremy? Yes. Uh, how we decide on the size of uh, the bin itself and the token? Yeah, so obviously um, there's more information if you have like less populated uh, bit vectors. And so you can like extract more information. Obviously, if it's if the bin's too large, um, the bit vector will likely be like all ones. Um, and so you kind of want to tune the bin size and the token size to have like a reasonable um, rate of ones and zeros. Um, we don't really have a, um, we, we basically just like sweeped a bunch of different sizes and heuristically found um, specific values that were good for um, human reference. Um, but obviously this can be tuned based on whatever, whatever particular reference you're using. I see. And do you consider the reverse complement of the strand or just the forward strand? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So we do not. We only look at um, the, the full, full string. But yeah, I guess in hindsight, we probably should have been looking at the reverse complement as well, because those are also valid alignments. I see. Yeah. Do you think you should build another bit vector to uh, consider the complement of the strand, or uh, maybe you can find a simple hack? Yeah, so I would say the easiest way to adjust that is to, for every single read, basically just reverse complement the read and then map it as well. And then it should work. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. Yeah, for all other students, feel free to ask questions in the chat or just enable your microphone. Go ahead, Jeremy. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. So let's look at in a closer way how these bit vectors split up the reference genome. So we have these bins that are overlapping across the whole reference. And we have these bit vectors that represent each bin here. And so um, basically we have a lot of these bit vectors depending on like the bin size and the obviously the bit vectors depend on the token size. And so to calculate, to give you a ref, like a feel of how, how many bit vectors or how, how large the memory consumption would be just for this, we, we can calculate it by using like the number of bins that we split the reference into. Um, and we multiply that by the size of the token or the size of the bit vectors. Um, so this equation is just like four to the n because there's four different uh, sequence types or nucleotides. And then um, T would be the number of bins. Bins. And so for a bin size of around 200 and a token size of five, the memory footprint is around 3.8 gigabytes, which is reasonable for uh, modern memory sizes. So it can completely fit within like these, uh, these memory constraints.
So now let's talk about how we would go about checking a bin for existence or possible existence. So we have the read sequence here. Um, and we first try to extract all the tokens from the read sequence. So this is all the overlapping tokens here um, of size five. So we see that we're just extracting them. Um, and then we basically wanna see how many of these tokens exist within a bin of a particular location in the reference. And um, if you think about it, like more occurrences of tokens um, that are shared between a read and a bin indicate higher likelihood of that read existing within the bin or that read matching well within the bin. Um, yeah, so if there's like an error here, um, maybe a couple of these tokens will be missing, but depending on, I mean, if everything else is there, then um, for the most part, you'll have a high number of token matches. So taking all these tokens, we look at the bit vector for a given bin number, and we query um, all the token, all the bit vectors with the token um, indices um, according to the bit vector setup. And we basically just sum all the existence uh, bits here. Um, afterwards, we compare to a, a threshold. And if it's below the threshold, then we discard it because we don't have enough matching tokens between the read and the bin. But if it's above the threshold, then we can send it to the read mapper for sequence alignment. And this is basically how we're um, discarding potential locations that must be aligned. So how would we integrate GrimFilter into a full read mapper? So GrimFilter takes in a read sequence and all the potential seed locations as input. And remember these potential seed locations are taken from the output of querying the hash table. Um, and it feeds it to the GrimFilter, which essentially calculates the existence or the potential existence of uh, that read sequence within every single bin um, of the potential seed locations. And so it'll spit out a seed location filter, filter bit mask where one indicates, yes, you have to check this bin for existence and zero indicates no, um, it's definitely not there because there weren't, weren't enough tokens. So we send this um, bit mask over to a seed location checker. Um, which takes, which compares the seed location checker to the potential seed locations and only um, passes on the seed locations that actually pass the seed location checker, which is basically the indices that have a one. Um, anyone that has a zero is basically discarded. Um, we then send uh, these locations to the reference segment storage, which, um, which extracts the segments from the reference. And then we finally calculate the edit distance um, using the read mapper. And so here we see that we're discarding uh, one out of three locations um, of the visible ones here at least, and therefore we're saving time on the actual edit distance calculation. And then we output the correct mappings. So how do we map three or GrimFilter to 3D stack memory? So as a recap, GrimFilter is comprised of very simple addition and comparison operations. And to check a given bin, we sum the bits corresponding to each token in the read. And then we check, and then we compare the sum against the threshold to determine whether to align. So it's highly parallel. Each of the bins can be operated on independently and there are many, many bins. And it's also memory bound because we have to frequently access um, the large bit vectors um, in order, and yeah, we have to we have to access them very frequently to calculate the potential existence. Um, and these three properties we find um, together make GrimFilter a good algorithm to be run in 3D stack DRAM, which you know has high throughput um, and like you, you can operate on things very parallel inside the logic layer. So 3D stack memory is basically a bunch of DRAM layers that are stacked on top of each other. And they're connected with TSVs, which are just um, vertical connections that allow high bandwidth between layers. Um, we also have a logic layer, which enables you to move uh, DRAM data at high bandwidth between the layers to the logic layer, perform calculations, very simple calculation on the logic layer, and then put them back into DRAM, um, depending on whatever is implemented in the logic layer. 
And so we have this high bandwidth as well as this stack customizable logic layer, which enables the processing in memory. Um, and this processing memory offloads computation to this layer rather than um, transferring all this memory or data into the CPU, having the CPU process it and bringing it back. Um, so it alleviates the memory bus. And we can embed these Grim filter operations into the DRAM logic layer and appropriately distribute the bit vectors throughout memory, throughout the DRAM layer, so that we can effectively um, parallelize these operations in the logic layer. And you know, there's a, a lot of a lot of these three stack DRM technologies that are commercially available, such as high bandwidth memory and um, HMC. So each of these DRM layers um, are organized into arrays of banks, and a bank is an array of cells with a row buffer. So the row buffer holds one row at a time and uses this structure to transfer data with high bandwidth into the logic layer via TSVs. We now show that the distribution of bit vectors across the DRAM arrays to enable parallel processing of the bins. So each row represents a token's occurrence across many sequential bins, and the row of the appropriate tokens gets queried to find a vector showing the occurrence of the token across many bins. And these are the vectors um, that are brought down into the logic layer to be operated on. So now let's look at the implementation of the logic in the logic layer. Grim filter only requires very simple design for enabling bit vector sum and threshold compare across many bins simultaneously. One comparator, one incrementer, one accumulator, and a buffer for each of the bins that we are checking in parallel. And this results in very low overhead and ease of implementation. So for example, in HBM2, we use 4,000 4, incrementer LUTs, um, seven bit counters and comparators in the logic layer, which is very simple to implement. And of course there are details in the paper. So now let's get into the results. Um, so to gather our results, we, we, perform, we did performance simulation using uh, an in-house 3D stack DRM simulator. And we evaluate 10 real read data sets, which is from the Thousand Genomes Project. Each data set consists of 4 million reads of length 100. And we evaluate two key metrics, which is performance and the false negative rate, which if you remember is the ones that pass the filter but do not pass the alignment. Um, and we compare this against the state-of-the-art filter FastHash, um, which was the state-of-the-art at the time, um, when using Mr. Fast. But Grim filter can be used with uh, any read mapper. So here we have the plot of performance where the y-axis shows the time in terms of um, 1,000 seconds each. And on the x-axis, we show the different data sets. Um, this is just how we label the data sets in bioinformatics. And we plot for both the fast hash filter and for Grim filter um, for total execution time. And um, we use the sequence alignment error tolerance of uh, 5%, which is pretty typical. So we find that we get a performance benefit of up to 3.7x here, and on average, uh, 2.1x. And GrimFilter gets a lot of performance due to its hardware and software co-design. So in terms of the false negative rates, um, <clears throat> where the false negative rates here are on the y-axis, um, we get 6x, up to 6x fewer um, false negatives, um, which means that you you can check much fewer um, locations for alignment. And Grim filter utilizes more information available in the read um, to filter because we're extracting overlapping tokens, um, whereas a lot of places don't use the overlapping information. And so throw out a lot of information that might be um, there. There are a bunch of other results in the paper, such as sensitivity of execution time and false negative rates to error tolerance of string matching, um, we look at the read mapper execution time breakdown, and we look at sensitivity studies on the filter for the, the different parameters like token size, bin size, and error tolerance. And in conclusion, we propose an in-memory filtering algorithm to accelerate end-to-end -end read mapping by reducing the number of required alignments. The key idea is that we introduce a new representation of coarse grain segments of the reference genome, and we use massively parallel in-memory mem operations to identify read presence within each coarse grain segment. Our key contributions and results are that we have a customized filtering algorithm for 3D stack DRAM, 
And compared to the previous best filter, we observe up to 3.7x uh, read mapping speed up, and we have six up to 6.4x fewer false negatives. And Grim filter is a universal filter that can be applied to any read mapper. So again, here's the slide that shows the title, and you can access the paper through all these links or QR codes. And yeah, thank you for your time. And please ask any questions if you have any. That was great, Jeremy. Uh, so I have a question um, about the read length or the sequence length. Uh, do you think such filter would work uh, as expected uh, for much longer sequences? So it would take a lot longer to um, calculate like, you know, the, the bit mask because you have to extract all these tokens and now you're adding up so much more. Um, so I don't know if it would be feasible or like whether you'd still get speed up, but potentially if you increase your token size and like change your parameters so that you are not, so that's not so computationally complex, um, it's possible, but I think for longer reads, there there are probably better methods um, that that would require a lot of changes to Grim filter. I see. So, um, if calculating this bit factor would consume a large portion of the time, would it make sense to make it as a pre-processing step, for example, and uh, um, have a new format instead of FastQ file, for example, and then just having these bit vectors stored somewhere, load them, do the comparison. It might be very helpful for uh, application require you to do this filtering many times. For example, in metagenomic, you have a lot of reference genomes and you use the same data set, exactly single FASTQ file, then you try to compare it with many of them. So you wanna load maybe the representation, the bit vector representation of single reference genome, and then those coming from the FASTQ file, do the matching and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it makes sense to have some, maybe some kind of cache that has like, represents partial bit masks of like, you know, some subsequences. So if you see like a subsequence very frequently, then you can just immediately take out that that mask and like add it to the other masks potentially if you have like that kind of capability. Um, I think, yeah, you could potentially get a lot of speed up from that, but I guess that, that would be very specific to instances where you have reads with like a lot of subsequence overlap. So mm -hmm. it's I would say it's definitely possible. Um, we didn't look into that, unfortunately. I see. Uh, yeah, I think uh, when you started this project, uh, read uh, very long reads were not available. They were not practical because I think the error rate was around uh, really huge. I think around 40 to 60% of the read is not certain. I think this work was around 2017, the first draft you had, right? Right. <laughs> So I'm not sure how much benefits you can gain if you do the exact same method, the same uh, design on very recent architecture with 3D stack memories like FPGAs with uh, HPMM, HPMM um, uh, capabilities or Samsung, for example, the new devices or UpMem architecture, for example. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure like as, as logic layers get more complex, um, you can add more complex uh, functionalities and have, have better mechanisms for this. Can you expect the ratio, how much speed up you can gain just by uh, using different uh, device? Um, that's, I, I could not come up with a number confidently on the spot, no. <laughs> yeah, it's really difficult to predict that. And also, since you have uh, a lot of information coming just from the filter, for example, you know already that these five characters are the exact match uh, between the read and the reference genome. Do you think we can uh, exploit this information to do fast alignment as well? Um, Instead of trying always to do the alignment at base level. So now we already have tokens, right? Can we do token-based alignment? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I guess if you know like which regions are perfectly matching, 
then maybe you can kind of localize the alignment to particular regions of like two sequences, which is kind of what I've started looking into recently. Um, and, and there is some potential there. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know more. Yeah. I don't know more like, I haven't thought of more complex things other than just looking at like localizing alignment, um, but potentially. And once you do that, I think you can enable uh, more efficient compression algorithms, right? Because now you can represent a very long sequence of DNA just using bit vector, where you represent five characters using just single bit, for example. Yeah. I mean, the, a large problem is like, you could imagine two completely different strings that have like a very different like edit distance to have the same exact bit vector, just because like the tokens are very small. That's and true. And so it's, you would probably have to have some kind of like, um, like location information along with the tokens in order to actually create something more intelligent. I see. Yeah, probably it requires an auxiliary data structure that can accommodate maybe the location of these tokens, not just the token exists, does not exist. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if we have questions on YouTube from whoever watching us. Let me quickly check. Yeah. I don't see any questions. Yeah, feel free if uh, someone else has any questions. Now you have the actual Jeremy. Uh, with us, so you can ask him directly the questions. Because last time we were watching the YouTube, uh, the video offline for the same topic. Going once, twice. Right, uh, I have no more questions. If you want to add something, Jeremy. Uh, no, I, I guess if there are no questions, then I can end yeah. early. That was great. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone uh, for being with us until this very late time. So yeah, enjoy the rest of the evening and uh, Take care. Stay healthy, please. Okay. Bye-bye.